in one reason only is when, funnily enough, Swiss private bankers, a whole group of them, about 15 of them, sat down with my current chairman now, David O'Ban, and said, we need a solution to help us fight these bad guys who are banking money in Switzerland. <coughs> Ten years ago is when Switzerland took it on the chin once again for banking Sani Abacha's <coughs> money. Now, for those of you who don't know Sani Abacha, General Abacha stole, they say, between six billion, now whether it's US dollars or pounds sterling doesn't really matter, but he stole six billion from his country's treasury. And that is still under dispute. And the Swiss private bankers at that time said, we have a problem. We have people who catch a plane, cross oceans and continents, come to our doorstep and want to bank this money with us. But we don't know who these people are. Yes, we identify them. Yes, we have a copy of their passport. But we don't know who they are. Now, someone like Sani Abacha, General Abacha, did not fly to Switzerland with his military uniform and set off all the metal detectors. He sent his frontmen. He sent his diplomats. He sent his cronies to open these bank accounts. It is not written on these people's faces that I am representing a politician or I am representing a head of state. So the Swiss bankers wanted a tool put a name in and the flag would come up to say this person is the chief minister's son or nephew. Because what we have found over the years is the corrupt politician does not have his ill-gotten uh, money on their own name. One of the most recent examples is the former president of Taiwan who's spending life in prison today for, for, for money laundering. Not one dollar was on his name. It started off on his brother-in-law's name, then it went through a series of companies, and then it landed up with his son and his daughter-in-law. Everyone knows who the president or the head of state of Taiwan is, certainly when he's sitting as head of state. No one knows his brother-in-law. We track the brother-in-laws son-in-laws and the daughter-in-laws and the front men and the cronies of all politicians. Because you cannot have a corrupt politician without them first being a politician. And that is how we were formed. It was 10 years ago for this. Now we've grown considerably since then because we are also in the area of anti-terrorism and anti-money laundering and anti-organized crime and narcotics. But I'll reserve my comments regarding corruption for this session. And I will, if I'm asked, I'll discuss about anti-terrorism. So that's my three minute bit on how we are making good money. Is there a minute remaining? A minute remaining. Okay, how do we make money on this? Yes. We allow access, qualified access, to governments and institutions that want to screen either their customers, so in a bank's case, KYC, has become a four-letter word in Indian banking today. <laughs> we sell access to our database for banks and other financial institutions to screen their customers against our database. There has never ever been an instance, and we deal with 4,000 institutions, where, where we have not spooked the institution, where they have said, oh my gosh, we did not know we would be in business with the most prolific weapons trafficker in all of West Africa. And you know what? He was our most profitable client. Now this banker has got a very serious problem. They know who this client is because they know that the proceeds of his income are from crime and criminal activities. And two, does this banker want to give up his most profitable client? That is a dilemma for banks. Why do governments use us? Governments use us because of our information that we collate regarding terrorism. And that now is gaining an enormous amount of traction because we've seen time and time again, governments do not know who's crossing their borders. 
I'm done. Jane, uh, can I ask you an immediate follow-up question, which is, uh, do you work in India in a small way? <coughs> we tend to be very shy about where we are based. My business card will not tell you where our local office is. And that's mainly for security reasons. We do not want a Russian organized crime gang leader I'm coming to meet us in our office without an appointment. With an appointment, I'll make sure I'm not in the office. <laughs> but it's very clear. You cross this person's money, he'll kill you. It's simple as that. And it's not just the Russians. You cross the Yakuza's money in Japan, they'll kill you. In Mexico, not only will they kill you, they'll dismember you and put you in 15 different provinces. This is nasty stuff. We can't make it easier for them to find us. Do we work in India? Definitely we do. The good thing is, we have been successful in being very low-key, so that the ordinary person, or let's say the gangster, does not know where we are and who we are. But for those people who need to know who we are, and who can benefit <coughs> from our services, we make an attempt to reach, to reach out to them. Thank you very much. Uh, may I now turn to Lord Desai, Lord Nikhil and Desai, <coughs> man of enormous distinction. Uh, I had the privilege of meeting him in Mauritius uh, almost two decades back. Uh, <coughs> Lord Desai, uh, you have a scholar's approach to the issue of uh, corruption, uh, a theoretical approach to corruption. Uh, would you say a little bit about it? Uh, sure. Uh, let me first of all say that I have lived for 44 years in a country which is remarkably free of corruption, even by European standards. It's remarkably free of corruption. I don't, I, I know who my MP is, but I don't have to go to my MP to get my electricity permit, my telephone permit, anything like that. The state delivers its, it, the things I'm entitled to for which I do not have to seek the favor of any politician. Now, UK wasn't like that once upon a time, but it got to be like that. So one of the things to do for somebody is to study how UK got to be the way it got to be. And it has to do with uh, civil society, journalism, political movements, etc. Now, my take on this is, I, I would start with this quotation that Pandit Nehru asked uh, his friend, Mr. Sri Prakash, who was the governor of Punjab at that time, in 1959, and he said, I hear there's a lot of corruption in India. Uh, what do you think? And Sri Prakash said, I don't take bribes, but I can't get by without giving bribes. Uh, and I, so my take on that is, first of all, why do people give bribes? And especially, I'm not so much worried about big corruption. You know, I'm not really worried about Madhu Koda, Agu, who somebody should worry about, I'm not really worried about that. I am worried about petty corruption. Because petty corruption is an inequitable tax on the people who are not very well off. The poor in India, the BPL, pay 800 crores, well, paid 800 crores in bribes uh, in uh, 2006, 2007 <coughs> to get things that they are entitled to to get help from the police, to get the ration card, to get the kind of thing that they should be. So the question is, why does it happen? And again, as an economist, I say very simply, where are the local monopolies created which extract a small amount of rent? And clearly, in our desire to regulate everything, perhaps sometimes for good reasons, we have created laws, and for those laws, we have administrators who sit in various offices, and you have to go to them, fill out a form, and say, I want this. But that person has got a right. His right to delay, he's got a power to delay. On perfect occasion, you now you haven't got a proper certificate, you need you need so and so, three witnesses. It is not that it is lacking, it is blowing, but what I do think the result to you. <coughs> you want things done. You see what this is about. You say, okay, you know, you live in Jale. And therefore, you are paying money for to save time. 
very simple transaction. Now clearly uh, transparency would be would be better, I think, if everybody knew. If somebody knew when you had applied for something and how long it took to get permission, then they could detect corruption. Uh, right to information has been a very strong uh, weapon uh, in trying to fight corruption. And in a sense, again and again, if one can give rights to the citizens explicitly, which they can pursue, especially about delays in, you know, getting getting straightforward uh, documents, that would that would make a tremendous difference, especially using technology. Again, to give an example, I was talking about earlier on. Uh, one one of my one of my former students, who was an IAS officer, said that when he he deployed his chauffeur who had nothing to do all day, to basically log in each person who came into the office and what they wanted. And he said then he could see later on whether the people who came in had got what they wanted or not, if not mine, or he could ask his, his staff. And the power of delay, uh, which is basically uh, a, a money-making thing, was stopped. Now these, these, are, these are not, not uh, complete sort of examples. Now there are two things to do about this. One is whether we can simplify legislation. The entire, and uh, uh, Jay says something about KYC being a whole letter word. I call it kick your customer. Uh, because basically the entire Indian system is based on distrust. The whole Indian state treats its citizens with complete distrust. They presume that you're out to cheat them, and therefore you, you, you cannot be trusted. And this, 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 uh, relationship of distrust between power and, and a citizen is a great strength for the power to extract uh, some surplus out of the citizen. And one of the things especially business people should do as a political lobby is to insist not on abolishing legislation but simplifying legislation. Simplifying it. So why have you asked for these very, very, many things? Uh, and as you know, uh, uh, the, the three-wheeler drivers in, in uh, Delhi have to go to a veterinarian to get permission uh, to renew the license. You know, because they originally come under the horse carriage rules. And the horse carriage room people are required to go to a veterinarian to have their horse examined. And now there's still the three million driver who got no horse, still going to go to a veterinarian to get a certificate of fitness to conduct. But well, this actually happens to be true. Right? You know, now, it, there are all kinds of arcane rules, and this, it's, a, it's a marvelous piece of the Center for Civil Society who operate in Delhi have done some very good work on this. And I recommend you. Uh, uh, you look at that. And so, simplification of law. I think business, I think business, someone like CII and JP should have a standing committee to tell people how to simplify laws. So tell the government how to simplify laws. You know, don't say we don't want government at our back. Yes, yeah, government can be at our back, but can, can it please actually be helpful rather than. Rather. And so, again and again, so, and when new legislation is proposed, business should have a standing committee of simplification. So is it simple enough for citizens to understand and not be impeded by? And again, I am often urged that business in India it is too is too mild, is too self denying when it comes to governments. And under the been terrorized in the first thirty first thirty years after independence, the government terrorized business more or less. It, it infantilized what was one of the finest business community in the world. But now, you know, those those bad bad uh, great days of socialism have ended. So we can, we can get on and do something better. But I think it's very important for the users of these services, especially businessmen, because they have got more resources than ordinary consumer, actually get into inspecting legislation for simplicity, mm. for for transparency, for accountability, and they can fill us in. We will do business with you, you pass your laws, and when you pass your laws, let us look at them and advise you that is it. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Dr. Sir. I think uh, you uh, you brought a fascinating perspective. Perhaps one reason why business uh, is not as assertive as it could be with government is because of the old mindset 
of cozy relationships all the time. Shafi, a mother, brings a different perspective to this discussion. Uh, he approaches the issue of corruption at the micro level. Shafi, would you like to tell us a little bit about uh, what you propose, what you think can be done to deal with the issue of corruption? So, let me start <coughs> with the context. Uh, several, uh, around six years back, a few friends, uh, including me, got together and started a, a small ambulance service in uh, Bombay. Uh, and in 2007, I, I uh, went abroad to do a fellowship. When I came back, <coughs> I started uh, to come across from the media about a wonderful ambulance service being uh, started, uh, which started from Hyderabad and uh, spreading very uh, fast across uh, several states. I was very happy about it because they, when they were starting it, they had connected with me and I was also, uh, in, in my own small way, had contributed to uh, sharing knowledge with them. But a little later, what I realized was that while this service itself was wonderful, it was actually a rip-off on the Indian state. Uh, an ambulance service uh, which would have cost maybe a hundred thousand, uh, one lakh rupees per month per ambulance to run, <coughs> was being built to the various state governments <coughs> at almost 2.5 times to 3 times, that is 2,50,000 rupees to 3 lakh uh, rupees per month. So it just hit me, you know, I mean, why is it that nobody uh, was bothered about it? Uh, I kept, I went uh, calling on uh, government officials, the ministers, but uh, nothing happened. And I started, you know, I mean, getting more curious and, uh, you know, started digging more into it. Used Right to Information Act, which has really empowered all of us. And uh, it came up with uh, uh, information which actually stunned me. There was a serious ripoff happening. And uh, after all uh, doors, uh, uh, you know, I mean, no doors opened, a group of us. Uh, uh, filed a PIL in the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court actually because of the documents uh, submitted issued notices in this. This was October 2007 and until then nobody believed me. I mean everybody used to uh, make fun of me uh, and uh, question the motive. But then uh, a series of incidents happened after the Supreme Court issued notice which culminated on January 7th with Ramalika Raju uh, owning up for the biggest corporate scam in India's history. And this ambulance service which I was referring to started from Hyderabad. The entire scheme was devised by Raju uh, through a charity, not-for-profit organization to actually uh, while building this organization, take out as much money as possible. <coughs> this was my first serious uh, uh, exposure to, to such, a, such an instance. One thing led to the other, I started working in this field and what, what hit me more was what <coughs> Lord Meghan Desai just said. More than the large scale corruption, it is an individual demand for bribe especially for those common service entitlement, which is, which is your legitimate right, which is my legitimate right. I should get it under the law, under the constitution, under the uh, budget. It is my entitlement. But some officer somewhere uh, sits on that file and you don't get it, I don't get it. So a bunch of us started exploring how can we address this and we, we started uh, uh, attacking or pushing back these individual demand for bribes in individual cases, unlike uh, uh, Mr. Javed, who is uh, who is doing it at the macro level, filing the last scam, the scamster uh, money. We started uh, pushing this back, and what we realized is that when we actually push back, 
uh, in, a, in a case of legitimate entitlement, the officer is often much more scared than we are. And if we can push back, uh, we have now done around 45 cases over the last uh, four and a half months. And in all 45 cases, we have achieved success. And the, the reaction is like this. When we, when we go and push back, you know, uh, push back means we, we may write a letter, we may file an RTI application, uh, we may apply peer pressure. Uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of tools. I'll come back to how we are developing this. When we uh, push back, <coughs> roughly one third to 40% of uh, these officers say, shit man, I don't want to deal with this. You know, let me just give this grand approval and let this guy go away from my life. Another 20-30% says, oh, so you are trying to screw me. Let me screw you more and, you know, try to make life a little more difficult. And then what we realized is that we have to push back that one step more and then fear gets into his mind. In, by the third attempt, usually, we, you know, in all these 45 cases, we, we achieved success. So, the, the, the Based on this experience, what <coughs> this group is doing right now is exactly what uh, Mr. Javeri and his team did 10 years back to fight uh, at the macro level. We are forming a for-profit, fee-based, BPO kind of service where, where anybody demanding a bribe can actually call it and say, hey, in this X office, I need this done but I've been asked to pay a thousand rupees. For a fee, we will take on the responsibility of fighting it. Less than a thousand rupees. <laughs> yeah. Actually, uh, uh, the, the, the experience, is, experience is that, but there, in this 45 cases, there were seven people who actually offered to pay more than, more than the money demanded, saying that I just wanted to get this fixed. So, uh, this is the idea. But, uh, uh, you know, I mean, while we realized that this is the idea, we went to the registrar of companies and said that we want to register this company. <laughs> <laughs> so, we filed for uh, the name clearance, and the first name which came was like, yeah, I mean, what are we trying to do? We are trying to stop bribes and prevent corruption, right? So, let's ask for the name, Stop Bribes and Prevent Corruption Services Limited. <laughs> The registrar of companies, Maharashtra, has gone into it. You see, everybody knows me by now, you know, from the from the watchman to uh, registrar of companies, Maharashtra. They don't know how to deal with this. They have been sitting on it. So the first case that they have got on us, no, they have not demanded a bribe yet. <laughs> but the first case that we have to solve is actually you to get this incorporated. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, I think... I would really thank the three panelists, even at this interim stage, because they, what they, what they've done is they've put the dialogue on a new track. Uh, we see innovative ideas which uh, are far from the sense of despair, uh, sense of uh, uh, fatality, which is conveyed in the title, and which some of you, I think, uh, share. Let me first turn to Lord Desai. After listening to these two gentlemen who have, in a sense, presented a business model approach, a for-profit uh, method of dealing with corruption, are there any thoughts that come to your mind, sir, uh, as a theoretician, as an economist, in terms of possible approaches, possible practical solutions? Because I think we want, we want these panels, and we want the Aspen Ideas Conference to be, in a sense, a hands-on and problem-solving type of discussion, and not simply one of rewashing old laundry. No, I had not, I had, uh, what Shafiq said, I more or less agree with that. What you have to do is you have to go work at the micro level, insist on your rights, and I give. I've, I wish him all luck for his uh, 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 company. He should have called it, you know, Babu Raksha or Jala or 
something like that. I mean, nobody would have noticed, nobody would have noticed what it was. Uh, but I am more intrigued by what, what Jay Zaveri said because I have, I've always taken the view that basically big corruption is a division of a, a loot between the, between the supplier and the demand and who cares uh, what happens. But the question is, who will stop it? Now he has got a very interesting uh, party, a Swiss bank, for example, who themselves face some kind of legislation against accepting illegal money. Uh, the usual problem is that the protector, the guardian, is corrupt. And the guardian is not going to act against corruption because the guardian is part of the corruption. And I cannot imagine, uh, you know, what will happen in Indian politics if something like that happened. All politics will come to a stop. Uh, but see, so we have to actually find out in those respects who will bell the cat, as it were. And judiciary in India again and again has been the place where people have tried to try to raise this, this question. And no wonder Parliament is always after judiciary to try to curb their powers because they know who is going to be after them. So I think, uh, again, all, all I can say is that can we uh, then have people who systematically go to uh, the apex court to expose corruption and will they be able to get away with it? You know, again, as you said, for Yakuza, I mean, these are, these are your local homegrown gangsters. You know, they're not where you live, and, and you know, they're even more ruthless. Uh, so I think it's, it's a good question to say, here's the problem, it has to be stopped, but if you cannot trust the government to do anything about it, or executive do anything about it, who will it? Will it be the judiciary? Will it be the citizenry? Who, will, will the media exposure by itself be enough? For example, the media have got very good at this. You know, as so, because Historically, in Britain, corruption was reduced by these various things, media, political, uh, sort of non-government political activity, civil society, and things like that. So we have to use multiple instruments, and that, that, that's all I, all, I can, all I can think of. Thank you very much, sir. I think you have opened certain new and interesting tracks. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the media. Uh, you may recall the cover story in Outlook, I think the date is 27 December, the current issue. Uh, and quite honestly, I was shocked to be honest. I had heard that there are journalists who demand money to cover business events or particular types of events. But I had not realized that this, this had reached the level of organized methods of, uh, uh, I mean, a business model, you could say, really, of uh, corruption. Jay, what uh, comes to your mind as you listen to your fellow panelists? Are there any new ideas that come to you? Well, we have a, a very close role, a very intimate role with the, with the media, because where we get our information from is actually open source public domain. So within our organization, we have exceedingly strict rules on engaging with the media. And I'll tell you why. If the media knows our business model in terms of where we get this information, and we, we have about 280,000 sources, we pick up this information from all over the world in virtually every language. If there is an article written by a journalist in any of these mainstream media where there is some editorial process, so not blog sites, we pick up that name. What we have found in the past is sometimes in certain countries you can pay a journalist to write a negative story <laughs> about a personality or about someone. And three days later, they will retract that story by saying, sorry, printed in error. But it's no longer a headline saying, sorry, printed in error. That apology is usually page three behind the obituaries near the jokes or something like that, which people don't tend to read. The jokes, yes, but not the, the errors. We make a living from getting information from the media. If we know 
that they are doing this wrongly or for the wrong motives, then we have to be very careful about which media or which journals we engage with from a company you know, corporate relations and media perspective. So for us, media is sacrosanct. They, they, they should only be the truth in media. And any aberration to that should be punished very, very severely because they are the gatekeepers of truth for the public. Thank you very much, uh, Shafi, any further thoughts in terms of practical action? Now, you launched something and you <coughs> are obviously satisfied with the success you have achieved. Do you think this is a model that can be replicated? Have others come to you from other cities or other groups uh, seeking information on what you have done? Actually, uh, you know, I, uh, we were doing this under the radar I mean, in a very low profile way and uh, in a conference uh, last month when I, when I uh, spoke about this, the support that I received was unbelievable. And uh, more importantly, the support that uh, we have seen where people are willing to, willing to pay uh, the sum equal to the bribe demanded uh, to to get what is their entitlement in the right manner without paying the bribe. That is a point that you know nobody wakes up in the morning and say, okay, mm, let me let me let me see who I can bribe today. You know, I mean, none of us do that. I mean, or how can I corrupt someone? That, that's not how we wake up. So. The issue is this, the issue is neither you nor me or the common man, we don't have in our, in our struggle with our daily lives, we don't have the time, expertise, the resources or simply the wherewithal to fight this. As uh, Lord Desai was uh, telling uh, while uh, we were sitting in the lounge, an application made, if we had the willingness to wait for a year or two years, the approval would come through, but do we have that time? And that is what the officer is playing uh, with. And if, like, like, if you have a problem in the house uh, pipelines, you know, I mean, you, you call the plumber. If you if you have a problem with uh, pest control, you call the pest control service. You have a problem with security in your neighborhood, you hire private security guards. But for all the strengths of market forces and market economy, apart from Mr. Javeri's uh, service which is at the macro level, there is no service which exists where any of us can call and say, you know, I mean, I'll you know, I'll pay a fee, you, 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 you do this for me. But Shafi, there was, a, there was a key word that you used in your opening statement, which is when you said, when you have a legitimate demand. Part of the problem is that some of us also have a legitimate demand. And quite often the act of paying a service fee or rent, as Lord this I would call it, occurs in relation to improper demands. Any comments? Yeah, so, so uh, the, the issues that crop up out of the illegitimate demands Will, will get handled by his company and hopefully the one where, where it is an issue arising out of uh, yeah, I, I'll be able to handle it. That's a mean division of work. Okay, uh, I think we've had a... Can, can I say one thing before? before um, there's a marvelous film by Sean Benegal, his latest film, called Well Done Abba. If you get a chance, do see it. It's one of the most very funny films about rural, what now would be Telangana, uh, and about uh, permission to dig a well for which money has to be paid, and how without digging any well, you get a certificate that your well has got clean water, <laughs> is perfectly all right, uh, and you know, no questions asked, and you have to declare to BPL to get a grant. And when you get the grant, of course, everybody wants to cut, so they don't even get the grant. 
I just feel very, very, very beautiful for how then public pressure reverses this process and gets the well back. So that we're going on a mouthful sort of story. Thank you. Uh, we have about 35 minutes for an open discussion. I want to very warmly thank the three panelists and I would request you please to join me in a, in a strong round of applause for this outstanding panel.